We're going to continue our series called The Way, but we've been honing in on the fruit of the Spirit. We've done love, joy, peace. Anybody know what's next? Patience. <laughs> how, how many of you guys know anyone who could use more patience? Anybody know anyone? Let's start there. Just so you know someone. All right. How, how many of you guys know someone who causes you to need more patience? Anybody just want to be so bold? Okay. And so we're going to be hanging out talking about patience today. And if you don't like that word patience, because I could kind of feel that resistance, you know, if you don't like that word patience, let me give you the New King James Version of the word. Ready? Long suffering. <laughs> All right, so here's long suffering definition. Having or showing patience in spite of troubles, especially those caused by other people. All right, so let's just play a game. One to 10, 10 being like, like, you know, you, you're, you're, really, you're really good at this thing called patience. And one, like, you're not good. <laughs> Between one and 10, just play a game. Where are you at in your patience scale? You've, I'm just, where are you at? Just like, yeah, just rate it. Just where are you at? Maybe, yeah, rate a spouse. I don't know. That'd be more fun, wouldn't it? You know? Some of you guys might be saying, I don't think I'm long suffering at all. I'm not even a medium suffering. I'm like, a short-suffering type person, right? So we want to really wrestle with this, um, but the way I want to do it is I want to start off and just talk about how God is patient towards us. How many of you guys are thankful that we can start there, that God is patient with us? And Paul talks about this in uh, the book of 1 Timothy. He talks about kind of his backstory in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It says, this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. So Paul's saying, I had a big resume in the natural, but I was, I was really the farthest from God. He says, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display, here it is, his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. You guys are thankful that we have a long-suffering God that deals with us in his perfect patience. So I want you to know today and just, just hear this right, right from the outset that if you are messed up in some way, if maybe you're far from God in some way, or if you're struggling in some area of your life, I want you to know that you are a candidate right now for the perfect patience of God that you are perfectly positioned for the perfect patience of God. And I want you to think about, first of all, how, how much patience God had to have with humanity to even get us to Jesus. You know, God is all-knowing, right? He's omniscient, we say. He, he, knows, he knows everything. So that means that before God created the world, before God created humanity, that he knew that sin was going to come into the world. He knew that we were going to have a fall. He knew he'd have to create a rescue plan. And he knew that he'd have to create a path for us to experience salvation that's found in Jesus. But even though he knew all of this from the foundations of the world, the way that God sets this up is that he allows us as humans to have free will, to be able to choose whether or not we want to follow Jesus, to be able to choose whether or not we, we uh, want to love God or turn away from God, whether we want to obey God or to not obey God. And so God, in his patience, had to work all throughout humanity to allow prophecies to be fulfilled and to allow things to fall into place, people to say yes. You think about it all through the ages. God needed a Noah to build a boat when everything was corrupt. He needed Abraham to say yes to start a nation through which Jesus would come through. He needed, uh, he waited 400 years as the people of Israel were in slavery for a Moses, the right Moses, to stand up and to lead them out of slavery. He, he needed uh, the nation as they were dr drifting in and out of idolatry, even after they were set free. He needed prophets to stand up and to prophesy uh, uh, against what was happening and to speak the truth. He needed prophets to step up and to tell specific prophecies of how Jesus would come and how, you know, different things about his birth and his life. All of this was set up throughout people's yes and throughout 
years of patience. After 400 years of silence between Malachi and the pages of Matthew, he needed a Mary to be able to say yes to a plan that had, no one would ever think is pro- probable. And then he needed a Joseph to, to be able to be going with that plan and to do very specific things to fulfill prophecy. All of this is God's patience on display to get us to Jesus. But now I want you to think about all that it took to get the gospel to you. Even after Jesus dies on the cross, he goes into the grave, he raises from the dead, fulfills prophecy, the first, you know, does all this stuff so that we might have salvation come to us. There's still a long journey for that moment for it to make its way to us. The apostles had to be faithful in the early church. Martyrs would have to die. Early church fathers throughout the first, second, and third centuries would have to fight against heresy. Throughout the dark ages, faithful saints would have to keep the light on through those dark ages. Missionary movements would then emerge and come and spread the gospel throughout the the earth and Revivals would be needed, the Great Awakening, one and two, and different things. And in the uh, 1900s, then we would need the Jesus movement to be, have a renewal throughout the 60s and 70s and spread throughout Europe and, and uh, all, Central America. And then faithful pastors and leaders and disciples who have faithfully preached the gospel week in and week out throughout the nation and throughout the world to keep the light on so that the gospel could come and arrive at your lap one day. Faithful praying parents and grandparents and faithful Sunday school teachers and you name, the list could go on and on. But I want you to understand it took a lot for the gospel even just to reach you today. How amazing that is to think about. And the good news is this, that if God has the patience to wait through thousands of years of unfaithful people, the rise and fall of nations and all of this history for the preservation of the gospel to get to you. He had that much patience. I think he can handle your issues today as well. Whatever those issues are. Here's what I'm trying to say. All of this to sum this up. Exhausting God's patience is too big of a job for your sin to handle. You can't do it. You are not going to be able to do it because God is a long-suffering God. And he, he gives us chance after chance. And it's not that God isn't righteous or that God isn't just or that there isn't a righteous anger that, that, that God holds or has against sin. It's just that he's a long-suffering God. He, he's willing to be patient with humanity a lot longer many times than we are at times. James chapter 1, verse 19 reminds me of this. This is an instruction for us. It says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. How many of you guys know we could have a whole sermon on this verse right here, right? What this is also showing us is an attribute about God, that our God is actually slow to anger. And this is one of the definitions that keep popping up over, about God throughout the, the scriptures, is that he is slow to anger. So what does it mean for God to be patient and is specifically slow to anger? Well, we're following this pattern. We're going to have the Bible Project go a deep dive of this uh, phrase for us, and then we'll come back and we'll explore what it looks like for us. So slow to anger. What's it like? Let's watch. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently describe God's character in this way, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this third phrase that God is slow to anger. Now, that might surprise some people. Isn't the God of the Bible mostly angry, striking people down for their sins? Well, it turns out that God's anger in the Bible is way more nuanced than that and way more interesting. In Hebrew, the phrase slow to anger is pronounced erek apayim, or literally long of nose. But what does God's patience have to do with a long nose? Well, first we need to look at the common biblical Hebrew way to say that someone is angry. Their nose burned hot. Like in the story of Joseph, when Potiphar thinks that Joseph tried to sleep with his wife, his nose burned hot. It's usually translated, his anger burned. 
it's describing how your body, especially your face, gets hot when you're filled with anger. And so in Hebrew, the main words for anger are either nose or heat or hot nose. This is why a patient person is called long of nose. It takes a long time for their nose to get hot. Like in the biblical proverb, a person's wisdom is their long nose, that is, their slow anger. Now in the Bible, God gets angry numerous times, but God doesn't have a nose or get hot. These are metaphors using our experience of hot anger to describe how God feels when he witnesses human evil. Just like you would get angry if you saw a child being bullied on the playground, so God gets angry when humans oppress each other and ruin his world. In the Bible, God's anger is an expression of his justice and his love for the world. But he's slow to anger, which means he gives people lots of time to change. Like in the story of the Exodus, when Pharaoh enslaves the Israelites and has their baby boys thrown into the waters, God sends Moses to confront Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's given 10 chances to let Israel go free. But after the 10th refusal, Pharaoh rides out with his chariots to destroy the Israelites. And so God destroys him in the waters. Pharaoh's own evil is turned back upon him. And we read that this is an act of God's hot anger. Now, that's really intense, but think about it. God wouldn't be good if he didn't get angry at Pharaoh's evil and eventually do something about it. And notice that God's anger is expressed by handing Pharaoh over to the consequences of his own decisions. And this is actually how God's anger is shown throughout the scriptures, like in the story of the Israelites. Over and over again, for hundreds of years, they betray the God who rescued them from slavery. And though he gives them many chances to turn around, they keep giving their allegiance to the gods of other nations. And each time we read that the hot anger of God burned against the Israelites. But notice what always follows. God gave them over into the hands of their enemies. Israel wanted to serve the gods of other nations. And so God, in his just anger, gives them what they want as those nations circle back and defeat Israel. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans. He says, God's anger is being revealed against human evil. And then three times he says what that looks like. God hands people over to their destructive desires and decisions, even if it leads to death. But Paul also says, God is patient, giving people time to come to their senses and change. Because remember, God's anger is a response to human evil. And it's based on a deeper character trait, his compassion and his loyal love. God is not content to let people sit in their own self-destruction. In the Bible, God's on a mission to rescue. This is why Jesus said that he was going to Jerusalem to die as a demonstration of God's love for his enemies. He would stand in the place of his people who were choosing self-destruction and take the consequences of their decisions upon himself. In Jesus's life, death and resurrection, we see God's anger at evil and his love for people working together to provide forgiveness and life for a humanity lost in self-ruin. So God's anger in the Bible is really important, but it's not the end of the story. When God is angry and brings justice, it's because he's good. And he's extremely patient, working out his plan to restore people to his love. And that's what it means to say that God is slow to anger. And how many of us are glad that God is slow to anger with us in patience, and that's good. And so what we want to do is, now that we've kind of established that God is extremely patient with us, is to kind of see what does this look like in our life? What does it look like for the Holy Spirit to develop this fruit or result in our life? And so, of course, we could talk about being patient with other people. But I want to really look at, like, anybody ever struggle with making decisions, being impatient, making decisions? Anybody? Oh, just me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's me. Okay. Um, Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It's one of my favorite times to look at this. And it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And they went, and, they, and when they came to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but then the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, Urging, them, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. 
And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they're trying to make a decision. They're trying to go here. They're trying to go there. They're trying to figure out what the Holy Spirit is saying. And they are not able to be released by God until they get a word from God. I think that's important. Because a lot of times we just assume, right? Patience is the ability to respond in God's timing. Sometimes the most patient thing, this is going to sound weird, but I think sometimes the most patient thing you can do is to act quickly if that's God's timing. It's just simply discerning where God, in the timeline, God is asking us to act. Because patience is the character of God, and patience is directly connected to the timing of God. The ancient Greeks had two different words um, for the concept of time. They had chronos, which is that chronological time. It's time that's measured by, uh, you know, the quantitative time of just days, minutes, weeks. It's like that passing of time that just continues to tick away. But they also had a word for time that was called kairos. Anybody ever heard of kairos? Kairos was what many philosophers and mystics would refer to as deep time, or more like an opportunity in time, in the present, to move forward in a way that wasn't normal, in a way that wasn't part of the normal passing of time. And so what we see here in the book of Acts is we see a, I believe, a kairos moment Sure, they could have just gone anywhere, but what they see is an open door. And anytime you have an open door, it's a Kairos moment. It's like the anointing of God is on that moment to act. It's like a doorway. It's like something can happen in that moment that may not be possible in other moments. And so it's important for us to be patient, to figure out and discern what is God's timing, because what we're actually doing is we're trying to discern where the Kairos moments of God are. We have all these times and seasons in natural life, right? We've got fall is upon us. How many of you guys love fall, right? Oh, yeah, I love, I love you summer people, but I love, so, I love fall more than summer, pe- summer, summer. I love, I'm just giving you a hard time. Fall, I love, and I love Missouri because it's like as soon as you get tired of one season, like you, you only have a short amount of time to endure before you get to another one. And there's all these indicators of the changing of seasons, like the crisp morning and the leaves that are falling and just all of this in the air and people smiling again and, and all that so- sort of thing that happens when you get to fall. I'm just a fall person. But we have to discern those times, right? Like we pick up on those indicators, we discern them. We can come out and we, we, we recognize things that are happening. What I'm saying is when it comes to following after God, if we don't discern the times, we'll miss our moments. If we're just living by the chronological passing of time, we'll miss moments. One of the aspects of enduring in patience is to be connected with God in such a way that you can discern, discern the difference between chronos time of God and kairos moments of God. I mean, you guys know you used to have to wait until something was in season before you could buy it, right? You used to have to wait for a certain fruit or something like that. And now you can pretty much go to the store and just get whatever you want, whenever you want, because we have all these preservatives that, uh, you know, keep things available all the time. And so we can pretty much get anything we want, doesn't matter whether it's in season or not. This is where a lot of us try to live spiritually. We try to get whatever we want, whether it's in season or not. See, most of us, we know what season we're in many times. We just fight it. We try to get what we want, whether it's in season or not. So you could probably scroll back through our YouTube channel and find a weekend probably in August or something. I haven't looked, but probably, you know, in August or maybe even as early as July where I'm like wearing a flannel shirt trying to will fall to come. I mean, working against the odds, but I am trying to will it to be here. And that's what many times we do in life when we do not have this fruit of the spirit of patience. We're trying to get what we want, even though it's out of season. 
Patience is the ability to respond in God's timing. Try to discern where is not just the chronological passing of time, but where is the kairos moment that God wants to step into? And I heard this from John Maxwell uh, a while ago. And so if you're struggling with like, man, I don't know how to do this, you might be able to take this little tool and examine your life right now and just take it before the Holy Spirit so you can take a practical tool, take it into your prayer life with the Holy Spirit and say, hey, could you help me discern what may be going on? So he talks about different, I'm going to give you four different things. Wrong action plus wrong time equals disaster. How many of you guys have ever been there before? It's like the wrong time and you did the wrong thing and things completely blew up, right? That's pretty easy for us to understand because there are some things that are wrong anytime and all the time. But the next thing is right action plus wrong time equals resistance. Have you ever felt like I'm doing the right thing? Why am I experiencing so much resistance? Like maybe God puts something on your heart and you, you're like, well, this seems like the right thing. It may be the right thing, but it may be the wrong time. And you, are gonna, you may be doing the right thing and it may be the wrong time. And you're going to experience that friction of trying to, put what, trying to get what you want out of season. The next one is wrong action at the right time. So it is the right time, but you're doing the wrong thing and you end up making mistakes what I'm saying is what worked in one season may not work in the next season. Too many of us, we try to do life by memory or by repetition instead of by revelation. And so we end up going into one season and we try to replicate what happened the last one because it worked then, but now we're in a new season and it's the right time, but we're doing the wrong thing. We're, doing, we're trying to replicate instead of have revelation. And the last one, of course, is right action plus right time equals success. So what we're doing is we're getting connected with God and God's timeline. Taking that before the whole, and not just assuming that, that we know what's going to happen. We're going to connect our timeline with God's timeline. And, and that's, that's one of the areas we struggle with, with making decisions. How about another area? Has anybody ever struggled with trying to figure out what your priorities should be in a certain season? Like, what should I emphasize? What, what does God want me to focus on? Here's the next thought about patience. Patience makes space for what's important instead of what is urgent. So it not only responds in God's timing, but it creates a space for us to be able to be present with God enough to allow what's important to rise up above those things that are screaming in our ear that are so urgent all the time. If you want to stay on mission for God, the key to staying on mission is to actually narrow your options. The more options you have, the less clarity you have. Some of us right now, we're trying to keep all options on the table because it makes us feel good. Instead of creating some space, clearing out things that we know we should not have in our life. We know we should not be spending our time on. We know, but yet it makes us feel good to have those options. Listen, if you have decided to live for Jesus, you've already narrowed your options, by the way. You've already said, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing that, or at least that's the way it should be. But that's the key to living on mission. If you want to look back at your life and say, man, I'm happy with what I gave my life to, you have to give yourself fewer options. You have to take off the table some things that maybe somebody else that you know has on the table. You might have to get with God and say, I've got to clear out some of this space here. Uh, just because it's right for them does not mean it's right for me. But patience, it takes patience to create the space for what's important instead of what's just urgent. Because it's not just even about doing important things. It's about doing what's most important for you. It's about doing what's most important that God has called you to do, because you can make a case that everything's important, couldn't you? I mean, of course, especially if it's urgent, we can try to make a case for it. And so I gave you that John Maxwell grid. I heard this next thing from Dave Ramsey. He may have got it from someplace else, but he, he talks about it this way in four different quadrants. And you might take this with you before the Holy Spirit in your prayer time and say, is there anything I need to look at here? Quadrant one is this. They are things that are important 
and they're urgent. It's like you know they should be focused on, and they're also, they're necessary now. Quadrant two are things that are important, but they're not urgent. I could just get to them anytime, but they're important things. But it's not like there's something that it feels like it has to be done now, but they are very important. Quadrant three are urgent things, things that are saying, do it now. It's just not important. And then the last one is things that are not urgent and they're not important. So what I want you to see about this grid is the first quadrant, if you're trying to discern, man, where do I put my emphasis? Where do I put my time? This one should be easy. (laughs) This is an easy decision. It's like, you know it's important and it's urgent. Let's get after it, man. That should be easy. And I know we still struggle with this, but if you can identify things in your life right now, like, let, let me just say, even just spending time with God daily, that's important and it's urgent. It's something we need to do every day and it's very important. Like, those are easy things to start building your life upon. But there are other very specific things that we know it's important and it's urgent. It should be easy. The last one, quadrant four, things that are not urgent and not important, that should be easy too. It's like, it's not urgent, it's not important. Get this out of my life. And yet, how many of us, we struggle with things that we just keep in our life that are not urgent and not important and we waste our time on? This this is an easy one just to go home and make a list of things you know. Let's just get it out of my life. Let's just move on from it. It's the two middle ones that are tricky. Things that are important but not urgent. It's easy for us to dismiss or to delay something that is important. It's not urgent. It's not screaming at you to do right now. This is where spiritual maturity has to come in, where we get with God and say, God, what are those things that are important, but they're not, they're not vying for my attention right now, and move them up the list. And then the quadrant three is things that are urgent, but not important. Because how many of us, we end up spending our time on the urgent things because they're louder than everything else. Right now, some of us, we are distracted because we are spending our time on urgent things, but not important things. I heard this example years ago, and I may not get it right, and this may not even be how the study went, but it'll still be a good illustration anyway. Um, but no, I heard, I heard this, the, these sociologists wanted to do a, a study and try to figure out why people don't take the time to do good things and help people. And so this wasn't a scientific study. It was just kind of a social experiment. And so they went to Bible school students and they thought, oh, what better group of people? Let's just test them out. And they got a class of 10 of those students together. And they told them that their assignment was to prepare a sermon on the story of the Good Samaritan. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, the story of Good Samaritan. If you didn't know, there was a guy who was beaten up on the road to Jericho, left for dead. A priest comes by, passes by, doesn't help out. A Levite comes by, passes by, doesn't help help out. But then a Samaritan comes by, and he actually becomes the hero of the story, and he takes the time to help out. So they said, you got to prepare a message on the Good Samaritan, but you're going to preach it across the campus here in, in just a little bit. In fact, you're late. You need to go now. So he just like put the pressure on him. You got to do it now. We're testing your skills right now. Preach a sermon. Good Samaritan. Other side of the campus. Go now. You are late. So they all ran out of there. It happened to be in between where they were and where they had to preach the sermon that there was a person that was hurt along the sidewalk. They, they were living the sermon out. They just didn't realize it. And When they were told that they were late, only one out of 10 of the people stopped to help the person that was hurt. So they took the next class in there and they did the same thing, same setup, staged everything. And they said, you're not late, but you might want to hurry. And so when they told them that, you're not late, but you might want to hurry, four out of the 10 stopped to help. And then they took a last group and they were like, you got to preach this sermon. You can do it whenever you get to it, but you need to do it sometime today or whatever. You you just take your time. It was something like six out of 10 stopped to help. Very easy just to conclude that people do the right thing 
if they have time to do it. Most of us will. The problem is most of us don't have the time to do it. We, we have to create space. And so what patience does is it stretches out our normal time to create space that's normally not there in order to have the right priorities to do what's important, not just what is urgent. And so as we've been doing throughout this series, we're going to do this right now. We're going to just right here in the middle of the message, we're going to stretch out our time for just a little bit. We're going to create space for what's important. And that is for us to come back to the table and to receive communion together. And in this, we're just going to have a time where we connect with God. But I want to remind you of a very famous story that illustrates this in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? And the Lord answered and said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled by many things. But one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. What I'm suggesting today is that if we, and you're not going to hear me stop preaching this message, that we have to slow down to catch up to Jesus. We have to create space in our life. The spaciousness to be able to be present in real time with the voice of God, the heart of God. You will not be able to follow, you will not be able to discern those Kairos moments. You will not be able to recognize those open door opportunities if we're going faster than Jesus. And so we just create the space. So my hope is even right now in this moment that we would just create space to be present in real time enough with the voice of Jesus. Part of my job as a pastor is to help us create these moments where we can do that here so that you can replicate them throughout your life. And so that's the beautiful thing about when we come to the table. We're reminded of the blood that was spilled for us on the cross. The cracker reminds us of the body that was broken for us. We're reminded that the grave has now no hold on us. And we're reminded of what Jesus has done for us. And I think when we do that and we just sit with Jesus for just a moment, that it allows those things to rise to the surface of what's important. So if nothing else, just coming back to the table reminds us of what's most important. That we need to reorient our life everything around Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to take the elements, tables in back, tables in front, take it back to our seat. During this song, have a moment with Jesus. Listen to the words of this song even as, as you're having that moment and allow God just to breathe new life into you. Lord, we come to the table today and we just, Lord, we want to slow down enough to realize that you are a God who's slowing down too. You are slow to anger. You are patient with us. Lord, we wanna slow down and stretch out time enough to be able to discern what you're doing on the inside of us, to be present to the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you remind us of those things that we need to be reminded of that are most important the good portion. Lord, we know it starts with you. So we take this time right now to have a moment with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come. Slow down, take time, breathe in each sin. He'd reveal what's to come.
love the line there that says, and you who hold the stars, who call them each by name, will surely keep your promise to me that I will rise in your victory. I think sometimes one of the areas that we struggle in is that endurance, that holding on part, right? Like when you got a promise from God or maybe when God has put something on your heart to hold on to that, you know, that patience, that patient endurance as the Bible talks about it. Does anybody struggle with that endurance? Maybe you've got a promise right now or something you're praying for. This one's for you. This last one's for you. If you've got something you're holding on to, you're struggling with it. I was reminded of the story of Daniel. You know, Daniel, he's getting ready to be, uh, you know, all he is is just being faithful. He's just serving God. Long story short, he was set up and he gets thrown into a den of lions, okay? So that's where we find ourselves in Daniel 6, 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. That's a pretty dead end, isn't it? I mean, it's like, if you didn't know anything about the story, if this was the first time you heard that story, and this is what you read, how many of you guys could make, be pretty safe to make a conclusion how that's going to end, right? In fact, the story says that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. I always like to imagine it as if the scene, like if we had a snapshot of that scene and, and we see the, the den of the hungry lions and Daniel midair like being thrown in and like the stone ready to be put over it and he's just like, and we get just a snapshot picture of that moment. We could make a conclusion about how that's going to end, right? Aren't you glad though that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end? And in the natural, how that story would have a beginning, a middle, and an end is totally different when you add God into the mix. And that the ending is different with God. And so many of us right now, you may be in that snapshot moment where it's like, you've got a promise, but it doesn't look like that's the ending that's going to happen. And if we had a snapshot of your moment, we could probably come to some pretty safe, natural conclusions about how that's going to end. But if you have a promise from God, here's what I want you to hear today. Patience feeds on promises, not, not snapshots. Patience feeds on the promises of God, not the snapshots of your current moment. You will not endure in patience if all you look at is the snapshot. We've got to get our eyes back on the promises and off of the snapshot of where things currently are. See, Satan's job is to get us into wrong thinking. His job is to try to get us only living in that snapshot moment where that's all we see so that we start making conclusions about how the story is going to end. And if all you're looking at a snapshot is right now, that's where you're going to live. That's where your mind is going to live. That's where your imagination is going to go. That's where you're going to come up with all the conclusions in the natural because there's a snapshot in the moment. So here's a question for you right now. Will I prejudge my future based on a snapshot of my present? Or maybe I could put it in a different way. Am I prejudging my future because of the snapshot of my present? You will not patiently endure unless you get a hold of the promises of God. See, some of us need to get a hold of the promises of God again. We need to remind ourselves, as, as I say, reservations determine the destination. When you make a reservation on a flight somewhere, you are predetermining where you're going to end up. Way before you get on the plane, you've already paid the money, but that because you paid the money and you have a ticket, that means most likely you're going to end up where that ticket says, right? That's the way it is. Some of us have got reservations 
to natural endings instead of God endings. My hunch is that's where you'll end up. It's not that God won't intervene. It's just that there's so many things along the way where we just need to patiently endure. Some of us need to get hold of the promises of God again and reset our reservation to a God destination. We've got to look back again at the promises of God and the faithfulness of God and remind ourselves. We were talking about this in our real life group the other night about, you know, how we can get into the what ifs. Like, man, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if that's wrong? And what, what if that goes bad? And what if? I always like to turn it around instead of like a what if, you know, what, what if this thing, bad thing happens? I always like to turn it around and say, well, what if God? Like to use my faith imagination to say, what if God comes through? What if God were to do this? What if God's promises are true? What if God is the God of faithfulness? What if God is a God who comes through on his promises? We've got to get a hold of the promises of God again. Why do we get impatient with the promises? I believe there's a lot of reasons, but here's one reason I believe we get impatient waiting on a promise. Because there's a temptation to make an idol out of what we're waiting for instead of worshiping who we're waiting on. When we make an idol out of the thing or the whatever we're waiting for, we start to only see that. And then we start to see all the reasons why that is not sufficient or that's not going to happen or that has many problems with it. But come on, come on. if you keep your eyes on Jesus, this thing over here is pretty small, isn't it? So we've got to reset the promises of God in our heart. Patience and promises are connected. We tend to think it's only faith and promises are connected, but no, patience and promises are connected. You have to patiently endure to see the promises. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11, last, last scripture here. It says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope to the end. This is patient endurance. So that you may not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who watch this through faith and patience inherit the promises. It's not just faith that inherits the promises. It's faith and patience. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Abraham is called the father of faith, yet it was faith and patience that allowed him to obtain the promises. He tried to circumvent the plans of God to get the promise, and he was impatient. Bad things happened. He had to go back to patiently waiting in faith for the promises. Will I prejudge my future based on a snapshot of the present, or will I patiently feed on the promises of God? Will I turn my eyes back on Jesus. So as the worship team comes back up, let me just recap this for us today. If you struggle with patience towards other people, I want to remind you to remind yourself of how patient God is with you. If there's somebody right now you're really struggling with, man, just, just remind of how much patience it took for God to get the gospel to you. If you're struggling in patience in your decisions, just be reminded that it's those kairos moments that are the anointed moments. Those are the window moments of God. If you're struggling with patience in, in your priorities and what's important or what's urgent, just remind yourself that important and urgent are not the same thing. We've got to create space for the most important things. Patience does that. Does that. If you're struggling to endure, I want to remind you that what you feed grows. Am I feeding on the promises of God or the snapshots of the presence? Am I feeding on fear or faith? What you feed is going to grow. See, this patience that we're talking about today is not something that you can produce fully in your natural. We need the Holy Spirit to, to cooperate. We need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He's gonna produce this in us, but we have to cooperate with him for that to be drawn in and through us. 
That's really the, the only issue. As I said a few weeks ago, it's the same with all the fruit of the Spirit. We're three-part being, spirit, soul, body. The fruit of the Spirit is available in our spirit because the Holy Spirit is there. The question is, will the fruit of the Spirit make an appearance in my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions? And that's where I have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's the beauty of, of, of renewing our mind is we just get to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow this to be drawn out into our mind, our will, and our emotions. And that's what we wanna do by focusing on Jesus. So let's stand up and let's, let's set our hearts to worship him one more time. Lord, we, we focus in our heart on you. Lord, we thank you that you're so patient with us. Holy Spirit, would you come and develop this fruit in us, this fruit of patience, so that we would be able to discern the times that we're living in and respond in your timing, so that we'd be able to create space, not just for the urgent things, for the important things. And Lord, that we'd be reminded to feed on your promises instead of just a snapshot of the present. Lord, draw us near to you through patience today by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.